Good afternoon. I hope you had a really good lunch. I hope it wasn't a lot of pasta and potatoes so that I'll be more entertaining than I think I am. Um, my name is John San Giovanni. Today we're going to talk about mastering basic facts and um, well, let's just get started. One thing for you to know, lower right hand corner is my email address and Twitter handle. And you also should know that all of the slides will be made available to you. You're welcome to take pictures, write down whatever you'd like. But I might go before you get to snap that picture. So you'll get the slides um, if you need them. That being said, you already filled out a table tent with your name. And I appreciate that. I'm going to ask you to add to it. Um, can you add your favorite number to your name tag? Your favorite number. <laughs> Did I hear that? My favorite number is seven and I wrote nine. <laughs> That's good, Carol. Okay, so after you write, after you write your favorite number, what I'd like you to do is say hello to the folks at your table and tell them why that is your favorite number. So go ahead and share for a moment. We're going to come back together in a minute and 47 seconds. Go. On here or just chalk? No, chalk. This is my basketball number. And I... Right away. I don't have reason. Which is this. Exactly. Okay, so, so I'm going to ask some questions. Raise your hand if your favorite number is four. Just look around the room for a second. If your favorite number is four. I thought I saw even more than that, but there's a lot of fours in the room. Uh, how about seven, if your favorite number is seven? <laughs> how about 77? I saw you back there. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about me for a minute. My favorite number is five, um, and here's why. Bo I was born October fifth. So let's talk about that. How many people have a favorite number tied to their birthday? Ah, oh, who knew? How many people have a favorite number tied to a sibling or a spouse? To a son or daughter? How about because you're a gambler? <laughs> there you go, thank you. There, there's always two of us. Um, but there's probably more, just we're the not bashful. So if you're a gambler, there's one. Great. Um, how about if it's tied to a jersey or a sporting event? Ah, perfect. How about a, an address where you lived or grew up? Hmm, interesting. Um, so my name is John. My favorite number is five. October 5th is my birthday. Um, growing up, it was my jersey for hockey, baseball, football, everything. Um, and it turns out that it's my wife's favorite number. And on our first date, we went to a horse track. And the five horse won five times. I know. We didn't figure it out until the fourth race, though. So it wasn't very, very lucrative. Um, we, were married, we were married on May 5th which is 5-5, five, five. Um, because, only because the church was available. It had nothing to do with our favorite numbers. And it also turns out that all of Mexico celebrates our anniversary, which is really cool, right? <laughs> Drinks are much cheaper on our anniversary than almost any other day of the year. So that's, that's great. Um, yeah, now you see where you're headed for the rest of the day. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about myself uh, professionally. Uh, right there, I am um, the elementary mathematics supervisor for Howard County Public Schools, halfway between Baltimore and Washington, about 20 minutes, well, 20 miles either way. And if you're driving, it's about five hours. Um, lower right-hand corner, those are books that I've been fortunate enough to publish. We'll talk about, we'll talk more about that um, today, obviously. Upper right-hand corner are universities where I teach. Upper left-hand corner are national organizations that I'm active in. I'm actually a board member for NCTM. I speak at all of those places. Um, lower left hand corner are organizations that I consult for. Here's what you really need to know. Although I'm a supervisor, I'm in classrooms three, four, five times a week. I am and always will be a math teacher. I'm married to a math teacher. I have math students at home. You know what our dinner conversations are like. <laughs> we never have dinner together, so <laughs> we don't either. Um, <laughs> but um, so, and, and actually our students, our kids are 16. I make the joke that he's not going to see 17. And we have a 12-year-old as well. Um, 
So I'm married to a math teacher. I am a math teacher. I've taught kindergarten, first, second, fourth, and fifth grades. I've also teach, teached, I also teached, I didn't teach language arts, apparently. Um, I've taught language arts, uh, geez, now I'm off. I taught sixth grade math, but at the university level, and that's a really long story that you don't want to know. So um, that's a little bit about me, and today you'll learn a little bit more. Let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to do today, and the first thing I actually want to do is play a game. So what you need is on your packet, the handout from me, on the front cover, or on a notebook paper, or whatever you want. I need you to make eight rows with three columns. Eight rows, three columns. May I borrow your big dice? Yep. Thank you, ma'am. Which one are you going to pick? Oh, you want blue. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> this is my opportunity for a formative assessment. Who likes really, really, really straight lines? Who recognizes columns and rows? <laughs> So as you're finishing up three rows, excuse me, <laughs> three columns of eight rows, can you, um, similar to the screen, can you put a header on top of the first row, or excuse me, the, thir the first column, and make that header tens, the middle header ones, and the header on the right side to say total? All right. So. The game is called Target 100, here's how, here's how we play. Um, you're going to roll a digit and you're going to decide whether or not you want to put it in the tens place or the ones place. Right? So my first roll I rolled a 2, I put it in the tens place. My cumulative total is now 20. My second roll I rolled a 3, I put it in the ones place and my cumulative total is now 23 because I had two tens and then I added three ones. Make sense? My next roll I rolled a 4, four tens makes 63 and then I kept going. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so now you need to know the rules. Rule number one, you cannot go over 100. Okay? Rule number two, you have to roll eight times. If you have 99 on your third roll, you're gonna lose. Um, so it's kind of like blackjack, don't go over 21. Don't go over 100, have to roll all eight times. One other thing, when you put a number in the column, it stays there. If you move it, we call that cheating. So you want to put, if you put it in the tens, it stays the tens. If you put it in the one, whatever. By the way, you don't have to follow my pattern. You're free to, you're free to use whatever, you know, you can put it wherever you want, whenever. If you roll a zero, it counts. It counts as a zero. Okay, that question came up earlier today. Um, I think that's all the rules. Anybody have any questions? All right, let it rip, see what happens. Okay, so you should be finishing up your eighth roll. I didn't hear any no whammies, but I did hear, uh, I need a five, need a five. So let's talk a little bit about the game. Here's what I tell my teachers. Here's what I believed as a teacher. Here's what the research says. Games are phenomenal. They're great for developing problem solving skills, number, sense, reasoning, and also as a supervisor and even as a team leader, as a classroom teacher, they're also the most abused things that were ever used, right? My kids would go take a game to a corner and talk about Monday Night Football. <laughs> right? Or what they were going to do for recess or why, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to say to you is that um, we'll talk a little bit more about accountability with games as the day goes on, but it's also the fact that we use games as a hook to get kids interested in math, right? To get them doing something. I mean, there's, warm ups are fine, but I could argue that a game is a nice way to get everybody excited about math and talking about math that day. I'm, I'm using it with you in that exact method. Speaking of using games intentionally, here's how I might use this game in a classroom. Um, I might ask questions like, how many people have a sum or, or a total, excuse me, a, a final number that is greater than 70? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. You're really good. Fantastic. And so then I might ask the class, what are some numbers greater than 70? And I might solicit those, write them on the board, things like that, right? So I might ask, does anybody have a number with a five in the ones place? Raise your hand if you have a five in the ones place. And so now the conversation could be, what are some numbers with a five in the ones place? And of course, that's more than just 75, right? 
that's 85, that's 65. I might have my students right now work with a partner to find the sum of themselves and their partner, right? I could work on multiplication. If you rolled the same score four times in a row, what would your total score be? I could have you find the difference between you and your, yourself and your partner. We could find out if there are any numbers that were more frequent than others. We could, this could be a probability lesson. Were there any numbers rolled more fre frequently than others? Um, another thing I might do is have you all put your numbers on a number, on a sticky note and turn this into a giant number line between 0 and 100 and ask you to come up and put yourself on the number line, right? And then change the endpoints from 0 to 100 to 0 to 200 and ask kids what do you think is going to happen? Can you stay on the line? I know you can, you know you can, but some of our kids aren't so sure. So those might be some things that I could do in my classroom. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, if you take a look at the screen, there are three bullet points. How much you use it in your classroom, how much you modify it, what would you look for while playing your game um, or while kids play the game? So what I'm trying to say is if we're using games properly, like if, if they're being used in, in an effective way, as teachers we might need to be thinking about these bullet points. You don't have to answer all of them. I just want you to talk about one bullet point with somebody sitting beside you. Okay? We'll come back together in two minutes. Go. Oh, so you're talking about like developing the written record yeah. of it. Okay, so Patty, you're number two. I'm going to Cali first and I'm probably going to come to you. I'm just preparing you. That's a great idea. Well, no, but it's creating accountability is how you might assess students while they're doing it. Maybe not second, but in the top three. Okay, can you take 30, uh, 10 seconds to wrap up your thought? All right, so let's talk for a moment. Let's talk for a moment. What, um, what bullet did you talk about? Did you talk about how you could use it? Did you talk about how you might modify it? Did you talk about what you would look for? Um, anyone care to share your great ideas? I heard lots of them. All right, Callie, go ahead. I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> That's called a plant. Um, we had two. Uh, we said we all are upper grade teachers. I don't know if everybody in the room is or not, but we said change the target to one whole and use tenths and hundredths. And then also to change the target from one hundred or one whole to two and have kids discuss how did your strategy change and where you place the digits um, when you change the target. Fantastic. So uh, just to catch that in case you didn't hear it, instead of target one hundred, it's target one and the columns become tenths and hundredths and it works in a very, very similar way. Um, that's a nice modification. Then the idea is that I could make it target two and have different conversations. Nice. Um, what other things did you talk about? I'm looking for two other ideas. Yeah, go ahead. We talked about the importance of them writing it down and holding them accountable. Great minds. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Um, no, the, this idea of Help, helping kids be accountable with games, one way is to develop the written record. So as you're playing the game, you have to record what you're doing. So you rolled a two, that's two tens. Maybe depending on the grade level, you're drawing pictures, I don't know. Um, maybe you're keeping track on a hundreds chart. If you're working with thousandths or, or decimals in general, um, maybe recording it in a different way. But something that holds them accountable for the, the game that they played, recording them. We're going to talk about that as we work with basic facts. Um, so that's nice. Um, I heard this idea. Instead of making a target 100, I make a target 0 and count backwards, right? Um, I might let kids actually move the numbers around. Like, here's your score without moving them around. Can you get closer by actually moving them around? I worry, well, what would you do? A student rolls a 9, first roll puts in the 10's place. <laughs> yeah, you laugh right now, but really you'd be crying inside. You're just <laughs> like, it's going to be a long year, right? Um, <laughs> So, so um, target one, target 1,000. Um, modifications, I might provide tools. Hundreds charts, number lines, base 10 blocks. They aren't cheats. They're just helping kids understand the mathematics and, and work out of that concrete um, towards that abstract idea. Last but not least, you talked a little bit about how you might use it. It could be a center. It could be independent practice. I'm going to say it. It could be homework. Like play with a sibling, play four times, record what you did. Um, and we'll talk about games being used in those ways as well. Um, just to move on, that's what Target 100 might look like with tools. That's what Target 1000 might look like. 
And so before we put this away, I, I need to know who won, because that's important to me. Uh, <laughs> I was, well, yeah. Who won? How many people have a number in the 90s? Oh, really? How many people have a number greater than 95? Greater than 95. Greater than 95. Oh. But less than 100. <laughs> right. I got 112. You lost. How about uh, 98? That didn't cheat. 99? 98. 98. Higher, greater than 98. 99? Greater than 99? You have 100. I seriously do. I believe you. She defended herself before I even. <laughs> Show me your work. Um, <laughs> so I want to see your rules. All right, so very well done, well done. So it's a game that can be played in lots of different ways. You're smart people. Modify it, take it, use it however you choose. Let's go ahead and move on. That was our introductory, that was our warm up, but let me tell you this. If it works with adults at 1245 after lunch, I promise you it works well with 10 year olds at any time of the day. So what's what is today all about? Well, today we're going to talk about strategies for um, helping students master basic facts. We are going to reflect on what we've done in the past and what we can, what we might do instead. Um, we're going to make connections to enhance our teaching. We're going to discuss strategies and last but not least, um, what are ways to promote fluency. Those are some of the things that we're going to do today. Throughout the day, we're going to connect all of this work to Omaha's academic uh, action plan, see how these two complement one another, the, the components of it that are up there right now. Um, so those are the things that we're going to do today. But let's just really just walk into it. That's what our kids do. <laughs> Going through life, enjoying life, and then wham, out of nowhere, multiplication tables, right? And so that experience is actually true for a lot of us. As, as kids, myself included. And so what is that like for kids and, and what might we think about differently? Can you talk with a partner? Um, let's go with 38 seconds. What challenges do you face with basic fact instruction when you were a student or as a classroom teacher? Go, go ahead and talk 38 seconds. Okay, that was 36 seconds. I was off, but it's okay. Um, I'm not going to solicit all the challenges, but here's some things I can tell you I've heard. They use their fingers. They stomp their feet. They can't remember anything. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Those are things that I've said. <laughs> right? And actually, as we go through the day, I'm going to share ideas and strategies and things about research and all this other stuff. I don't want you to think that I was like this teacher that had like a cape and I was freaking great. My first year, every one of those kids deserves their money back. Um, <laughs> Right? And it was a public school, so it's like a tax break. I don't know how, how it works. But, um, but I learned every year a little bit more, right? And I know that we're all in the same boat. And so at no point do you want to look at anything today and be like, oh, I've done that. I'm horrible. That's not my message to you, right? My message is that throughout my career, I learned how I could grow as a professional and get new ideas, right? Sometimes things challenge my thinking. And I was like, that's never going to work. But I was forced to do it, and then I was like, oh, that really worked. And then I had to admit it in front of people. Um, so challenges I've heard, like kids are using their fingers. They just don't know their facts. Um, they stomp. They pat their head. Um, they don't practice. Like, I, I've said those things, right? Um, they, they need to use paper, which is interesting, because at the same time, I was like, well, I want you to show me your work. But then, but when it comes to basic facts, don't show me your work. And so I send some mixed messages sometimes myself. Those are some of the things um, that I was challenged with with basic facts. Maybe you said some of the same. Here's what I can tell you about basic facts. Essentially, um, they provide a foundation for more complex math skills, but you already know that. I can also tell you that you need to master them probably by the time you leave elementary school, but for many of us, and people in this room, it probably didn't happen until the end of middle school. All of them. And for some of us, it wasn't until the end of high school. And there were some of us that it wasn't until college. And some of our GT students don't know, gifted and talented, don't know their facts. Um, so it's not necessarily associated with um, the math that you're working with necessarily or your age. But it does lead to complex mathematics skills. It's easy for some students. Maybe you were that kid. I wasn't. Um, in fact, in researching the book, I called my mom and was like, hey, um, I learned facts in, what, it was like two weeks? She's like, it was more like three years. <laughs> it's like, crap. Um, but I was above grade level, right? And she's like, well, 
we let you think that. Um, so I can tell you this is true that you probably know because maybe you're this kid. I had this kid in my last session. It produces high anxiety for many students. Um, teaching undergraduate courses, um, I, one of the first things they do is have to use words to describe math. And I always have people that describe time tests with words like inferior, frustrated, not good, using those types of things. And every time I'm thinking they're talking about math, and I'm like, so tell me about math. And they're like, that wasn't math. That was when I learned my basic facts. And so it has a condemnation, con I can't say it. It trickles over to everything else. Um, but here's what we do know. It's a lot easier if you understand operations. So tell me if you know the student. Um, his name's Robert and, well actually, his name's Robert and, um, he can recall all his facts, but he can't, if I give him 12 counters, he couldn't show me 12 divided by 3. Right? He memorizes the heck out of basic facts, but he didn't have a clue about math. Um, maybe you know that kid. I've taught him. It's easier if kids understand operations. It's easier if students understand patterns and properties. Um, and we're going to go into that today. And last but not least, it's easy if many, um, there are many opportunities for targeted facts. Let me say more about that. How many people in here, we're just talking multiplication division, started with all of your zeros first? How many people can't remember? Okay. <laughs> because you're, oh, no. Because uh, <laughs> you had a great night last night. Um, so, how many people think they started with their zeros? All their ones. Did zeros, then ones, then twos, then threes. Right, because that made sense. How many people just had them all thrown at them in a baggie? <laughs> that was me. Actually, this is the story of my mom. I came home one day with all my fact cards and they were colored. Um, and apparently that was the lesson for the day, cut them out and color them, which is a pretty, <laughs> pretty good lesson. Um, and there was no rhyme or reason and we just went through cards. So today we're going to talk about maybe there's a more strategic way to do it, but more importantly, if we're going to practice facts, maybe we should practice the facts we don't know. Right? Mingled with some of the ones we do. And better yet, maybe we shouldn't practice all 200 or so. Maybe we should just practice a narrow set to get really good at that and then build off of that. Does that make sense? That's not the way that we've all done it necessarily. So I'll talk about that with you today. Um, but before I go, that's what you have to do right there. Not you, but our kids. Memorize all of those. Oh, and by the way, um, and you have to know all the division facts that go with that. And you have to memorize it. I could barely remember my phone number some days, right? That's only 10 digits. So that's quite f a few more. Um, let's take a test. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you guys are already complaining. I love it. Um, can you get a pencil out for me, please? And what I need you to do, I need to get a timer because uh, we want to make it legitimate. Also, I have a $20 bill to the person who gets 80% or greater. You all should, no, let's make it 90, you're adults, you know facts. So here's the deal, $20, no lie, 90% or better, you've got one minute, sound fair? To do what? You're going to take a test, time test. Ready? Go to the back page of your packet that you walked in with. On your mark, get set, go. What are you laughing at, Aaron? It's 35 seconds. Oh no. 30 seconds. Tom, I'm going to need you to get started. 20 seconds. What are you doing? Get stuck. Oh. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Pencils down. <laughs> that was pretty close to a minute. Really close. It was really close. So let's just talk about that a little bit. The only thing I did wrong right there was I let you write with your dominant hand. I should have had I should have had you write with your non-dominant hand. So welcome to being a fourth grade boy. I mean, seriously, for some of us, that's what it was like. And then I had to translate what I saw in my head, get it down to my hand. How do you make a six? Does it go this way? Oh, yeah, right. Oh, now i got to write it. Um, and to do all that in three seconds or less is, is pretty complicated. Not that you shouldn't do it fast. That was your test right there, right? I'm guessing, and I'm just guessing, that some people went in and filled in, filled in the ones you knew. That's a great strategy. So everybody knows the ones. That's one. That had to be D, and that had to be C. 
right? Nice job. A little short of 10%. Oh, there's another one. There's one there too. Not so bad. Oh, there's one there. All right. Um, here's a question I have for you. There is a pattern to that. And, and there, there's a code to all of that. The question I have for you is, um, well, first off, it's not a question, it's a statement. I'm not giving you the code right now. All right, so just keep that in the back of your head. What if I gave you that test every day? Would you get better? At first you're like, well, yeah, sure. And I'm like, but if you don't understand what the heck's going on, you are never getting better, right? And by the way, I mean, I've done that where I've given it every day and then I'm like, well, why are the scores flat? Because the kids knew them, already knew them. Those didn't, they weren't going anywhere anyhow. What if you had an incentive to do well? Then you would kill it, right? $20 wasn't good enough. If I made it 50 though, you would have just rocked it out. What if I let you pull out of like a magic prize box where you could grab a new Ford or something like that? <laughs> That's the incentive, right? Um, what if we use flashcards every day? That would, that would do it. What if you practiced at home? Why wouldn't that work? Because it's still gobbledygook. You don't know what's on there, right? Okay. Traditionally, how have we taught basic facts in the United States? What I just described and you told me didn't work. Okay. Um, and by the way, when I say traditionally, I'm only talking about the last century. So the last hundred years, let's say. All right. And by the way, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, I've done some of these things myself. Um, so traditionally, we, how have we taught it? Well, with that approach, and for the same hundred years, what have we said? They don't know their facts. I'm not, com I'm pretty sure, I guess, I am confident. Isn't that the definition of insanity? <laughs> like for a hundred years, we've done it one way, and it doesn't work for most of our kids, and we're like, well, let's just keep trying that. So today, we need to talk about maybe something slightly different. Um, so when I first became a math supervisor, one of the things I was taking on was basic facts. That's how I lost my hair. And what I did was, I, I, I researched it and wanted to see what the research said, and I came across this, which is just flat out awesome. Drill and arithmetic facts does not necessarily lead to recall. I think everybody can attest to that, yes? Number two, drill must be preceded by sound instruction. Not music, but like sound good, instruction. And we're all like, that eh, makes sense, yes? That was 1935. So we've known this for a long time, but we haven't acted on it. As a, and, and so let me just say this. The approach has worked for some kids. And for those kids, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to make a huge change. But it hasn't worked for a lot of other kids. And so that's when we get into that idea of, of differentiation and different approaches. So let's talk about this. Why hasn't it worked for all kids? You hit it on the head. The fingerprints are up there because everybody's fingerprint is different. The way we all think about mathematics is different as well. Now granted, we see some commonalities like ways to make 10 and such, but we think about numbers and the way they go together differently. And to make every kid use or think like the same fingerprint is problematic. Um, so the way that we do things is based on really just the way we think about numbers and life in general. So when I worked on our program, the first thing I asked myself was, has our approach, HCPSS, Howard County, has it met the needs of all of our kids? And then I had to start thinking about, has it even met the kids, the needs of our, our, our the kids that are doing well? I asked questions that are similar to your questions in terms of, has it been good for all students? Has it been culturally res responsive? Has it taken into account that students come to us with different um, needs and, and strengths and, and what have you? Um, has it been optimal for students with, with, with learning needs, right? If I'm struggling with memorization, is that the best way for me to go in general? And I guess now's a good time. We, we need to get a handle on this idea of memorization. So we're gonna talk about that in about two slides. Again, I come back to the question, has our approach for the past 100 years met the needs of all students? And then the question becomes, any of our students? So then I ended up with this question. I don't know if you're familiar with the root cause analysis, where you keep asking yourself why's. And like this was one of the why's that came up. Why hasn't memorization worked? So why hasn't memorization worked? What I would like you to do right now is with a shoulder buddy, look at the screen for the next slide. I would like you to make a list of all the things you need to do in the picture. You've already done it today, okay? You don't have to write stuff down. You can if you like, 
This can be, when you see the picture, you'll be like, oh, I don't need to write that down. You can, I need a list of all the skills you need. Ready, driving an automatic. Start talking about skills. I'm going to interrupt because really I don't want this to be the main part of the day, but this will, will resonate with you, I think. Um, I told you I have a 16 year old, right? So the skills that you're about to list may or may not apply to all people. Um, so we're just thinking about driving, uh, uh, driving an automatic and let's just talk about what are some of the skills you need to drive a car? What, what was that? Oh, I think she just wanted Jolly Ranger. Um, I think I saw you make a key signal. So, like, you don't have to know how to turn it on. Right. And I have a rental car right now, and I did not know how to turn it on. Um, it's, yeah, it was different than what. Anyhow, um, well, I heard estimation, right? You need to be able to, well, you have to have spatial awareness. When you go to pull out, you need to be able to judge oncoming traffic. And every situation is different, right? Depending on if you're going left, or if you're going straight, or if you're going right, right? Are you crossing two lanes, or are you crossing one? How fast are the cars coming? And if you think about it, if we tried to isolate every one of those as a different skill, this list would really start to get long, right? Think about turning, I almost turned that off. Uh, think about turning the wheel. If I turn the wheel like that, at three miles an hour, it is profoundly different than if I do it at 90. Do you agree? Now, if you think about rotation and speed as an isolated skill at every mile per hour and every degree on the wheel, that's a lot, yes? What about this? If I step on the brake like that at five miles an hour, not so bad. At 90, bad. Not that you should drive 90, but maybe, I don't know. I'll, I'll make, it, make it 75. Um, you have to be able to read the signs, yes? Signals are optional, I agree. Even in Maryland, signals are optional. Um, or you can turn them on after you've made the turn, so don't worry about that. Um, mirrors, you have to know, uh, speaking of which, if you have a 16 year old and you've ever taught them to drive, they don't learn about mirrors until like mm, four or five months in. Um, yes, right, okay. So we're hoping he discovers them soon. Um, you have to be able to estimate like how fast am I going? Is that relatively safe? Is it, is it okay with the speed limit? Can I afford the ticket, right? Um, you have to know the gauges. I guess what's my point? My point is that you have to know a lot of stuff to drive a car. Do you agree? And if we try to break it down into little small skills, it's even more. So now, what if you're not driving an automatic, but you're driving a stick? Do you agree that all of those have to be really, really, really good to do that? Right. Now, question number two is, what if you're driving a stick in rush hour traffic? Yeah, right, your leg hurts. I did it for like 12 years. I wanted to kill myself. It was so bad some days. Um, but what's the point? You better know that really, really well. Do you agree? Because if not, that's a train wreck. What about this? What about you're driving a stick in traffic using a 1992 phone? <laughs> Stupid Google images. <laughs> but it was kind of funny, so I put it in anyhow. All right. You all have had that phone, or hope maybe you still do. Um, what's my point? You better know that, because that becomes much more complicated, yes? And then question number four or five, I don't know where we are. What if you're driving in bad weather, in traffic, on a stick, using a phone from 1992? If you are not dead, <laughs> it's because everything up there is really, really, really good. You, you, you almost, um, what's the word? You're, you're almost reflexive, right? You can almost do it without thinking. Do you agree? So how many of you have memorized how to drive a car? I'd argue you didn't memorize how to drive a car. How'd you learn how to drive a car? You did it a lot. And then you practiced certain things a lot. Like for instance, Oscar, my son, didn't start out on the freeway. And by the time he's 21, he may get there. <laughs> right now, speed bumps and target are a scary proposition, okay? My point to you is that you had 
practice, lots of practice in different settings that we're incrementally building on others. Do you agree? Now, some of us just jumped in and let it rip. Okay, maybe we had practice doing other stuff, and that did work for many of us. But the fact is, you didn't memorize a lot of things. Do you agree? Well, when it comes to driving a car, the situations always change. Ready? In math, that's driving an automatic. And that's driving in bad weather on a 1992 phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What am I trying to say to you? You need a lot of practice to get good at that, the basic fact, so that you can do the other things without even thinking about it. Does that make sense? But I will tell you this, and I'm guilty. We, and I've used the word memorization up till this point, I won't the rest of the day, that We've confused memorization with automaticity. One is a scientific something that happens. The other is, is memory. We, we memorize stuff, but we lose them quickly. Do you want to see the science of it? On the left side, you see a brain trying to find equivalent fractions. That's not exactly true, but I'm trying to paint the picture for what's actually happening. All right. So essentially what's happening is that's what your brain looks like when you're trying to find equivalent fractions and you don't know that 2 is half of 4 or that 6 is a third of 18. I almost said 8. Um, and you're like, he doesn't know anything about math. Um, this, on the other hand, is the same brain trying to find equivalent fractions when it does know that 6 is a third of 18. The point is, is that as our brains do things over and over again, we do them without thinking about it. Case in point, do you drive home the same way every day? Or have you ever been going somewhere and you ended up taking... Yes. <laughs> you missed your route. You missed your route, right? Because you're changing up your routine. The reason that happened is because of automaticity. Your brain does the same thing every day so that you can stop thinking about it intentionally and start singing along with Taylor Swift. Or, <laughs> or no, or I'm actually, I have a 12 year old girl, I do that a lot. Um, or, or, you know, you can talk on the phone even if it's not legal. You can do lots of different things because your brain can manage the car. Um, processing new information is a heavy work or heavy use on working memory. And more importantly, the more you do something, like drive a car, the better the skills become. And so therefore, you can do it without thinking. It becomes automatic. Here's the other cool thing about the science, if you're interested. Um, automaticity reduces the load on working memory by 90%. What that means is you are much more likely to be able to work with equivalent fractions if you see that 6 is 1 third of 18, right? Does that mean you have to know every basic fact before you can work with fractions? Absolutely not, right? You don't have to. But at the same time, the more you know, the better you are, right? It should not be a barrier to algebra. But sometimes it is, and that's unfortunate. So let me tell you a couple of facts about memorization, and then um, tell a couple of facts about memorization, and then we're going to put a bow on like the perspective of um, basic facts that we need to have before we get into some other things for the day. We're going to be taking a break in a few moments, so um, we're almost there. My clicker is not having fun. So here's some other facts you should know. This just came out last month. Um, so of the 13 million students who took the PISA test worldwide, not in the United States, worldwide, so including kids from everywhere, the lowest achievers were the memorizers. The kids that only knew procedures were the lowest achievers. Not just in the United States, all over the world. Um, the highest achievers on the opposite side of that, though, were the kids that actually connected ideas about mathematics and could apply them. It's not really that surprising when you think about it, but they could see how math was a connection. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about that as the day goes on. Um, some other things about memorizers being the lowest achievers. All children are different in their thinking, strengths, and interests. So then making every kid memorize when some kids don't think like that is problematic. And last but not least up there, math classes in the past decade quarter century, we as teachers have been trained to teach mathematics in a rather procedural way. That's what we were trained to do. It doesn't make us bad people. It just means that now we're finding that that may not be the best idea. So I asked my question to myself. Had our approach in Howard County met the needs of any students, including those that knew their facts? And then I started to be concerned because I wasn't so sure. The kids that knew their facts may have other problems. Let me give you examples. Um, to do that, did you know that computation in the real world is done mentally about 86% of the time? Um, which is amazing when you think about it. So what's that have to do with basic facts? 
Well, the question is, does memorization actually help or hurt understanding? So can you solve this problem for me in your head? Ready? Everybody good? Everybody got 76? All right, cool. All right, so that was test one. Step two is how did you solve it? So what did you do? What did you do? Okay, I'm coming here first. It was my fault. I kind of opened it up to the crowd. Um, what you said, add, you added 50. Added 50 plus 30 and then took off. You know what? I haven't heard that today or yesterday. I like that thinking. You went 50 plus 30 and then adjusted for 4. What I heard earlier today was I added 50 and 26. Both are, both are examples of comp, um, compensation. Both work. What's something else you did? There are no wrong answers, literally. Go ahead. Go ahead. I took the ones place, and instead of taking nine plus seven, I took nine plus one and made a ten. Uh, okay, so you decomposed the ones, made it a ten, and then did some regrouping with it from there. Okay, nice. Did anybody add forty plus twenty and then added sixteen onto that? Did anybody just do the algorithm in their head? That's fine too. Did anybody add forty-nine and thirty and took three off? So why am I doing this with you? Well, because right around this time, I was interested in seeing what we were, like our kids that knew their basic facts, did they actually have a good understanding of number and number sense? And so I was sitting down with kids and I was just having them do this problem for me. And it came to one little girl who said to me, do you want me to do it like I do it in school or at home? I was like, crap, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was like, why don't you show me both and I'll make the decision. So um, it turned out to be a really cool project for me because um, she did the standard algorithm because that's the way she was told she had to do it. But she said that most of the time she actually does it a different way. And so then I started asking kids just to do it a different way. So show me both ways, right? And interestingly enough, there's some of their work. And you talked about this too. Like, every, you know, every kid, they could all do that, which I felt good about. Then we had kids that were breaking apart 40, 20. And, you know, depending on the numbers, that's probably more efficient for a lot of folks than that is. But that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. I saw kids who did this. I saw kids who did this. And right now, you're like, well, what's he talking about? Does memorization contribute to understanding? Well, the problem is that I saw kids who did this. I had a chunk of kids that actually knew their facts really well, right, and had no understanding of numbers. So they had done a really good job memorizing facts, like the Robert that I told you about earlier, that didn't understand that when you add two numbers less than 50, you can't get a sum greater than 100, right? So what did he do? Well, 9 plus 7 is 16. I put the 1 up there. 4 plus 2 is 6. And then I do something with the 1. I can't remember what she said. I do think it was something about a box. Whatever. I'm just going to put the 1 there and be done, right? Because that's how a 9-year-old actually thinks. So. Um, and actually, probably not that slowly. It's like, I'm done. Um, but what am I trying to say to you? Unfortunately, I had the answer I didn't want, that our approach was actually not improving understanding for some of our kids, right? And so all I'm trying to say to you today, and all I'm trying to do right this first segment of our day is calibrate our thinking about basic facts. Um, the rest of the day will be much more hands-on and, and, and looking at activities and lessons for developing these ideas. But last part that I want to share with you, ready? If I memorize 6 plus 8, will it really help me with 56 plus 38? Might. But what about this? What if I learn basic facts in a different way? Or what if I had just developed number sense in a different way? What if I understand that multiplying by 5 is the same as half of 10? Do you agree that 5 is half of 10? So that means when I multiply by 5, excuse me, by 10 and 5, the one product should be half of the other. Does that make sense? So in other words, if 4 times 5, that should be the same as 4 times 10 and half of that. So what's half of 4 times 10? It does work, right? And I'm not advocating for a fourth grader to do this. But if I understand that, now I understand that. Do it with me. What's 68 times 10? What's half of 680? 
So if I learn, if I approach my facts that way, granted I'm not doing it when I'm in fourth grade, but I do have the foundation for thinking about numbers in a more complex way. We're going to do one more, I have two more, three more slides and then it's a break. Um, multiplying by nine is the same as multiplying by one less than ten. Do you agree? All right. So eight times nine is the same as eight times ten and one less group of eight. So that's 80 and one less is, one, uh, one group of eight less is 72. So now you can do that in your head. What's 24 times 10? 240. And now I need to take a group of 24 away, right? So that's like 220. It should be about 216. I am not advocating for a 10-year-old to do that in their head. I'm telling you a 10-year-old can do that in their head. Maybe not all of them. But again, I didn't learn how to do these things until I was much older. Having had the opportunity just to think about them as a younger student may have been helpful. Um, so does our traditional approach develop number sense? One of the biggest complaints is my kids don't have number sense, and I was probably one of the reasons why. And if they don't develop it in my classroom, when do they develop it? So we're going to go to break. Last thing for you is this. New brain science also tells us one other thing that's really important. Um, this idea of there is no such thing as the math brain. I know, I remember saying like, he's got the math brain, like he's a genius, right? Well, it turns out that's not actually the case. Nobody has a math brain. Um, it turns out that all students can do really well in math with specific types of teaching and lots of practice and this mindset that they can do it. Um, with that being said, all we did for this first part was just calibrate what it means to know basic facts and that idea of memorization or automaticity. Driving a car, right? And how is that like basic facts? The rest of the morning is, afternoon, sorry, is what are we doing in classrooms to help kids like get ready for basic facts? And then what are specific lessons, things that we can do to make it happen? Um, we're gonna take a six minute break. We're gonna start about one, is that 1.30? Yeah, right. Uh, one thirty-one on that clock. Got it? You have to stand up. It'll feel great.